two chapters today, and that would be Professor Umbridge and Detention with Dolores. And we're not actually really going to be talking about her. The big reason for that is simply because how often should we honestly give all our attention to the really horrible people in this world? If we constantly focus on the horrible people and what they do, then I think that destroys our opinion in humanity a lot. So instead of focusing on Dolores Umbridge, I'm going to look at some of the actions we're seeing from Harry here, and mo both mentally and historically how they're actually resonating. Um, to start, I would like to do a, a more complete breakdown of the discussion of PTSD so that we can really clearly see uh, that this is actually occurring with Harry. And for both parts of this episode, I uh, hope you don't mind if I'm reading a bit off uh, my phone. <clears throat> to start, I would like to get an idea of where Harry's sitting, because he and Dolores Umbridge are sort of the two main players in this set of chapters. And if we look at what everybody else is saying, they're putting as much blame on Harry as they are on Dolores. And I'd like to sort of just take a look at why we as readers can't necessarily do this, and what some of these other people are getting wrong. Okay, so let's just start with um, some symptoms, uh, specifically that here they've divided it into three types of symptoms, with the note, of course, that every person is going to experience PTSD separately and differently. Okay, so the first type is re-experiencing the traumatic event. Uh, this includes upsetting memories, flashbacks, nightmares, as well as feelings of distress or intense physical reactions when reminded of the event, uh, notably sweating, pounding heart, nausea, for example. Um, which, yeah, uh, we, can, we can check off a couple of those. Um, we've got some upsetting memories, we've got nightmares, feelings of distress, I think, can be included in here, including physical reactions. Um, really any time it scar hurts, we are getting some reminder that the last time this occurred intensely was his meeting with Voldemort. Now, type 2, avoiding reminders of the trauma. Uh, people may try to avoid activities, places, or thoughts that remind them of the trauma or are unable to remember important aspects of the event. Uh, you may feel detached from others and emotionally numb or lose interest in activities and life in general, sensing only a limited future for yourself. And this is the area that Harry is sort of experiencing less. Uh, simply because the exact situation is not likely to occur again. It didn't occur in a common place for him, so um, moments like that aren't liable to happen. But we are so seeing some of this detachedness um, and lack of interest in anything else. Interestingly enough, though, and I do want to point this out with the, the trio when they have that little moment when they start talking about future careers, uh, we do actually have a projection that there is going to be life for them after this war, and I appreciate the fact that they're having this conversation. Uh, type 3, increased anxiety and emotional arousal. These symptoms include trouble sleeping, irritability or outbursts of anger, difficulty concentrating, feeling jumpy, jumpy and easily startled, and hypervigilant um, on constant red alert. And there's, there's just Harry in these past couple of chapters. Like, um, he's had trouble sleeping, he's been very irritable, and he's definitely got some outbursts of anger. Uh, he's got difficulty concentrating, and he seems more partial to blame that on, on the type of work. But since we're experiencing this in multiple classes, there is some concern here. 
because uh, in fact I don't think he has a single class uh, that he's able to concentrate fully of the classes that we see. Bins is sort of, we can write him off because no one really concentrates in that class. Trelawney, we've got this weird thing where you can't sort of really get into it. Potions, he's missed an entire ingredient. And also, Snape is still a dick. Like, that was a straight-up dick move, and Snape was wrong there. And he's bullying a student. And... Defense Against the Dark Arts is just a complete write-off. But very quickly, he's one of the first that goes from paying attention to his book to paying attention to Hermione. So we do have this um, lack of concentration. And it really does seem to be that he's he's constantly jumpy. He's looking for hints in everything everybody says. We've seen this with Draco a lot. And the question is, how much does Draco actually know? Maybe Draco really is just picking words that Harry's hearing more because they're important to him. That Draco might just use in general. It's the same thing like when you learn what a word means, you'll suddenly hear it a lot more. Or seem to hear it a lot more. Um, so it's actually interesting. There's also some other common symptoms. Guilt, shame, or self-blame, substance abuse, feeling of mistrust and betrayal, depression and hopelessness, suicidal thoughts and feelings, physical aches and pains. I definitely think we've got some guilt and shame here, and definitely some self-blame, uh, particularly when he comes to when Cho comes to talk to him. Like right away he's like, she could totally write me off and blame me for Cedric's death. Um, thankfully it doesn't look like we have any substance abuse yet, um, but I think we should watch that in regards to the blood quill. How much of his acceptance of this pain has literally become his coping mechanism is something we should be concerned of. Feelings of mistrust or betrayal all over the frickin' place. Uh, depression and hopelessness, again I can see some hints of it throughout this. Pseudocidal thoughts or feelings. I don't think we've gotten anything clearly, but we should keep an eye out. Physical aches and pains. A little hard to judge on this one simply because we do already have this connection to Voldemort in his head and um, his hand that is now a concern. So we have aches and pains, but they might have other causes. So. <laughs> Interestingly enough, we then get this um, discussion in this guide about um, how your nervous system, system actually responds. And in fact, um, social engagement and the flight or flight response are two of the big ones, which we are actually sort of seeing with Harry uh, coming up against Umbridge. It suddenly really does not become an option to just sit down and take it. It really is this, okay, no, we're gonna, we're gonna deal with it. Uh, which then causes immobilization, where there's so much stress that he literally can't do anything. That's him sitting in McGonagall's office afterwards. Now the reason why I've wanted to lay this out really clearly with Harry is simply because we have nobody else addressing this. There is nobody in this book right now who is admitting to the fact that Harry has been traumatized and is still dealing with that traumatization. Even his friends and his professors, it's really, you just gotta get control of your anger. Which is like the thing that this guide tells you not to actually do. Outbursts of anger is one of the most notable things and the guide repeats that this is liable to happen constantly. But it also reminds the person reading, particularly in the section about helping somebody else deal with PTSD, is that you cannot constantly blame the person for their inability to deal with this anger. Because they can't. They're in this cycle in their head, and they're having difficulty actually addressing anything beyond the anger they're feeling. And you're less likely to be able to help them if you're cons constantly getting defensive because they're getting angry. 
So McGonagall telling Harry to just keep his, his head down and take a biscuit, not helping. Hermione and Ron saying, like, you don't have to take your anger out on me. Not helping, especially in the fact that they can constantly argue and that doesn't seem to be a problem. But the moment Harry wants to argue, whoa, oh, no, you just gone too far. We're both insulted. Yeah, no, he watched the kid die and then got tortured by a man that everybody thinks is dead, and now everyone's uh, convinced that he's a lunatic. Harry has a reason to get angry, and just telling him not to be is not actually helping. There are certainly ways you could help. No one actually is. Everyone is simply ignoring the problem, and we're then seeing Harry starting to try and cope in not super good ways. He's not communicating to elders now simply because Snape's bullying him. Minerva's written him off. Umbridge is torturing him and convincing everybody else that he's a lunatic. Fudge and the government have tried to try him. Dumbledore's ignoring him. No, he's not going to communicate with all these adults because they've all shut the door in his face. He's stopped communicating with his friends easily. He doesn't actually tell Ron until Ron sees his hand. We haven't mentioned whether or not Hermione knows at this point in time. He's closing himself off simply because even the people that say they support him are not supporting him. They're supporting what he's saying about Voldemort, but they're not supporting him emotionally or physically or mentally. In fact, they're rejecting him every time he has these moments of anger when he's expected to sit here and accept when Hermione or Ron get angry, particularly when they're angry with each other. It's unfair. Which is then why my concern is, moving forward, whether or not the blood quill use is going to become like a substance abuse to him. If this pain is going to be the thing that he both is trying to reject and will also accept except as punishment for who he is and what has happened to him, even though he has no control over that, but also to use that to bolster himself and, and back himself up. And neither of those ideas is actually a positive in the least. So I really think we do have to be careful with our reactions to Harry in this moment, simply because he is in a mental state that needs to be taken care of and right now is simply not being addressed. And that's concerning. The other interesting parallel that I saw with Harry in these chapters was in regards to Harry's final night of detention, the Friday night, when he's really etching it into his hand and actually watching out the window at the Quidditch pitch. And the reason that this reminded me historically of something is the window watching. And it reminded me specifically of um, Odette Handsome Hollows. And she was actually a spy um, for the British during World War II, and unfortunately she got caught by the Nazis and subjected to quite a lot of torture. Um, she had all her toenails removed, and she had a hot poker on her back several times, and she noted afterwards that one of the reasons why she never actually broke and told them anything was they made the mistake of facing her towards a window. And she looked out the window and focused on other things. She had children at home, a couple girls that she actually ended up making dolls for during captivity. Um, and she, she just focused outside at the world and, and everything else out there that at that moment she wasn't actually isolated from. She was deeply connected outside in this moment of intense pain inside. And you can actually see this amazing connection between Odette and Harry in this moment. Harry is actually embodying what Odette stood for in this moment of, of fighting for what 
she believed in and aiming to be part of that and, and help with that. It is actually noted that they did not think she would be a good person to have involved. Um, they said she was impulsive and hasty in her judgments and has not quite the clarity of mind which is desirable. Um, she seems to have little experience of the outside world. She is excitable and temperamental, although she has a certain determination. I think a lot of those we can certainly, again, look at Harry and see those descriptions. See why the, the Order of the Phoenix hasn't taken him in right away. We're seeing a temperamental nature about him. This hastiness to start fights. But there's also a determination to, to attach to the truth and fight for it. So when Harry's sitting there looking out the window and writing with the blood quill, he is acting as a tribute to Odette in that moment. This moment of looking outside and saying, this is what I am fighting for. Even in those moments of intense pain where you want to give up, looking out and saying, I can, I can do this, which then tells us reading that we can do this. Odette did this, and Harry does this, and, and we can do this. Moving forward, we can be terrified, but there are moments of hope, and whether that hope is perceived in Harry looking out the window, and Odette looking out the window, and us reading about Harry and Odette. These are moments where different periods of history and different styles of learning, literature meets history, meets politics, it's all moments where we are reaching out and, and grabbing each other's hands. And I really think at this moment that, that Harry and Odette are linked in this resistance against people who want to utterly destroy who they are and what they stand for. And I think we can link hands with them too. If we have the bravery to stand up, even if no one else is standing. Because we can take down tyrants. We just have to believe in ourselves and work towards that. And I think Harry and Odette show us that. Even if they're both suffering. And they both suffered greatly. But both of them came out alive. And I think that's, that's a moment of hope for us. That we too can go through hard times and come out the other side alive. It just reminds us that we need to be kind to each other. If someone is suffering, we need not to ignore that suffering, but to help address it, help deal with it. Bring everybody else up along with ourselves. It's not going to be any good if we're the only ones that walk out alive. But if we can help others survive, I think that's going to be key. I'm going to keep reading, and I hope you do too. See you next time.